as I mentioned, the, the first speaker for Music Matters this year um, is a Singapore success story for the music business. Um, so without further ado, while I get my notes sorted out, please welcome Meng Kwok from Band Lab. <laughs> I'm, I'm now uncomfortable shaking hands, but I'm so used to fist pumping that, that, there that, that we can. <laughs> the office will shout at me now for doing that. Um, Meng, thank you so much for, for joining at Music Matters. It's a pleasure. I'm glad we could finally do it. Yeah, and, and, and look, I mean, some amazing stories coming out of Band Lab and, and the whole group at the moment. But, but for, for people here and people on, watching live, give us a little bit of background. Tell us about Band Lab, tell us the history, because there's a lot of components now, right? <laughs> there are a couple of components. So, so I, you know, I got involved in the music industry actually back in 2012 through the acquisition of a company in Singapore called Sui Li. So I think you know, some of you guys, especially those in Singapore, will be familiar with this. Musical instruments distribute everything from Fender to Taylor to Martin to PRS uh, around the region as well. So, so a huge opportunity to actually take a traditional distributor, turn this into a great retail consumer, e-commerce experience, and then everything sort of spun out of there. So met my co-founder for BandLab uh, through that relationship. And then you know, BandLab kicked off 2014, 2015, uh, and many, many different things. Uh, out of that as well, we were owners of Rolling Stone from 2016 to 2019, the media division, and, and you know, really all the different constituent parts of the business have been growing since then. So the easiest way to think of our group today is three major components, musical instruments, so you know, we, we manufacture guitars in the US, we distribute them, we retail them. We also have the media side of the business today. We own the NME, um, which as you know, with putting on events is a, is a challenging thing to think about in terms of, of the COVID experience uh, with NME awards. And, and I guess we're announcing this later today, so it's, it's not gonna be a scoop um, uh, coming in 2022. Um, but the media side of the business, guitar.com, music tech magazine as well, which now lives on musictech.com as well as Uncut magazine. Um, but really the core and the heart and soul of a lot of what we're doing is with BandLab and the digital tools and the platform, the easiest way to understand it is sort of Facebook for music with GarageBand, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, Patreon built in, you know, a place you can make your music, share your music today. You know, very, very fortunate. The last time we saw each other, we had a couple of hundred thousand users. Today we have more than 40 million registered users around the world. More than 11 million songs being made every month on BandLab right now, you know, throughout the entire world of which, you know, US is our biggest audience, and we're very proud of being based here in Singapore to be able to build a company to actually serve the rest of the world in terms of empowering music creation. But uh, that's a quick background, you know, but I'm sure we could spend a lot more time with that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 look, a, a, a amazing story, and, and, and I mean, Band Lab, the original idea was basically just bringing mus musicians together. Is that still at the heart of it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the, at the very heart, and I think a lot of the, the team members will speak for this, it wasn't just, the, the comparison to something like GarageBand is not necessarily fair. You know, Band Lab to GarageBand is a bit like Google Docs to Word, or Sheets to Excel, or Canva to Photoshop. You know, and I think, but the social element was something very key. I was very fortunate to be one of the first batches, well, the first batch outside of the US Ivy Leagues to get Facebook when we were going through university and Freshers Week, which is kind of worrying and disturbing to think about now. But the idea of music making not just being about the tools, not just about creating sort of the next generation creation platform, but actually a place where music making is about community, inspiration, feedback, you know, and finding collaborators. Music making is inherently collaborative. And, and that was a big part that's been there from the beginning and today is something that has obviously blossomed and we've been very fortunate to benefit from that. Um, and fantastic, so it's a global, obviously you're a global network and you've acquired global brands. Um, just wanted to talk about Asia though and, and, and how important is, I mean obviously your headquarters are here, but how, how important is Asia to, to the group and kind of what percentage of your business in the network is, is here? Yeah, so, you know, I would say uh, there's, there's, there's no question that Asia is a key component for us, not just obviously today where the U.S. is the biggest audience, but when I think there's a great title of the panel later today, I think a third or two-thirds of the, the world's population, a third of the world's population in, 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 one, uh, in one meeting or one panel. But I think when it comes to why we, for example, launch Enemy Asia or Enemy Australia and some of the things that we're doing there, the responsibility of the big brands in our minds, especially from the media component, when it comes to the way that the music industry changed, you never had the NMEs or the Rolling Stones or the billboards build out of Southeast Asia just because the, the, the difference in the way that the music industry was transforming and changing as the move to digital happened. So actually, you know, we see a huge amount of talent in Asia. I think there are some you know, huge successes of late with what's happening with K-pop, but 
when you look at Indonesia and the hundreds of millions of people there, when you look at the talent in Malaysia, when you look at the talent in India, when you look at the talent in LATAM as well, which is a country that we're very big in for BandLab as well, you know, it's all around the world, but it's the responsibility of the companies to actually invest directly on the ground. And we've been very, very lucky that instead of taking just a pure licensee model, we can actually operate. We've got team members who you've been working with on the NME side in here in Asia, actually on the ground. You need to get the sense of the artist and be able to work with them because music is no longer just about broadcasting. It's narrow casting and becoming very, very regional and very local as well. Um, and by the way, I mean, if anyone has any questions for Meng, uh, we're going to be asking some questions in, in, in a bit. But um, what successes have you seen in this part of the world for, from, from the company standpoint? I think you know, for us, one of the, the basic successes uh, is the fact that we've been able to build a business that has or is more consumer-based, that is uh, you know, predominant market, biggest market US, out of a tiny com a country like Singapore. And I think you know, we've, we've been very, very fortunate to be supported by you know, the conditions to be able to work with a great team. We have more than 22, 23 different nationalities on the team. That was always the idea to build a global product you need to have global people with different understandings and, and, and awareness of, of cultures and ways that technology can develop. But I think you know, the biggest successes for us are starting to see the things that we're doing penetrating into, into the global initiative. So for example, with the NME Awards, you know, I'm, I'm very, very proud that, that this year in 2022, uh, again, my, my LPR will be upset that I, I say this before it's officially out there, but we'll be announcing officially that we'll have NME Asia Awards for the very first time to join the bastion of, of the great you know, artists who have won awards in history for the last, you know, 70 plus decades. As I've said, seven decades, yeah. So you heard it here first. But, <laughs> but maybe you didn't hear it here first. You didn't hear that the NME Asia Awards are happening in 2022. That we'll be, we'll be introducing finally, you know, Asia Award winning categories for, for artists to be, you know, participating in. You know, and last year when we first launched NME Awards after taking it over, there were historically only US, uh, UK and rest of world. You know, but we launched the NME Australia Awards uh, categories in 2020, um, you know, just right before the pandemic and, and Asia will be coming as well. You know, Fantastic. Well, congratulations month. that you didn't hear that here first. You have to wait for the release this afternoon. <laughs> Um, what, what, so we talk about successes. What, what have been, in the, in, you know, over the last few years, maybe the last two years in particular, what have been the main challenges for the company? So I think I've said this before. I've, we've had a strange sense of survivor's guilt that actually for music, you know, one of the areas that we were most concerned about in all aspects of our business. Our business is fairly wide on a broad scheme from you know, actual physical manufacturing all the way to retail distribution, things that were shut down and you're also dependent on dealers. There's also the media side where people can't go to events, our journalists can't go to uh, you know, uh, festivals and concerts and, and, and you sort of have to make up the content in that way. You know, so a lot of the areas we were most worried about, particularly let's say on the musical instrument side where shops were shut, we saw everything sort of move very, very quickly and, and where music we were worried would be something that was non-essential. And I think there was some great writing about uh, surveys where people saw musicians as non-essential. The reality is that for most people's lives, actually music and these passions and, and ways to find escape were more essential than ever before. So, you know, we count ourselves very fortunate that everything has grown you know, amongst the businesses from musical instruments, people playing guitar, more people playing guitar than ever before, more people consuming content than ever before through, through you know, sort of obviously being in isolation or locked up. And, and as they get out, they're excited to share more and there's lots of stuff happening. But on the BandLab side, obviously, the number of people who've gotten into music making with their mobile phone being the very first instrument in their hands, you know, if guitars are seeing that effect, I guarantee you know, the same effects are coming through on the mobile music making you know, aspect and that's where you know, we're extremely strong on the BandLab side and, and we've been very, very fortunate that those have just you know, blossomed through this period. And, and you know, what we're actually very bullish on is this massive influx, this adrenaline shot you know, of people getting into music making and getting into the engagement of thinking about music in a different way. When you take away live music and some of the traditional aspects of how a musician or an artist monetizes, they get more creative. Some of them, you know, become in worse situations than before, but, but there are a lot more artists today, you know, that are monetizing, actually getting some money through their work, through streaming services, you know, than ever before. It's just obviously more distributed, which is great for more people having that access, but it's very difficult because for certain artists, you know, it's becoming lower than a living wage, especially when you think about Western countries and in the US and in the UK. It's a tough career. It's, it's, it's a tough career, and I think, I think a lot is said again about streaming revenues and those kinds of things. And, and you know, for all the, the flack that streaming services often get, 
the reality is that today versus yesterday is a world where more people are getting paid for music than ever before versus a world in which only certain people were able to make money and make a lot of money through you know, music because distribution was a problem. Today, distribution isn't the issue anymore, it's differentiation. So I think, you know, although there was a recent study that, that, that talked about how the average working musician's wage in the US is $11,000, $12,000 US a year, yes, that's not a living wage in the US, but again, when you talk about the importance of Asia, out in Asia, that is a living wage. In many countries, that's actually a pretty decent wage in LATAM or in Southeast Asia. And so I think when you, when, you, when you put that in perspective and you go back to the question of how important Asia is gonna be, it's gonna be even more important than before, especially as it relates to music and creativity because there is an incentive there. There is actually a living wage that you could generate by being an artist today in 2021. And I think that's, you know, couldn't be more exciting. Now, I don't know if, it, but you're a, you are a, forgive me for saying this, smoking hot guitarist. I mean, <laughs> it's all relative. Um, but, but, but using your experience as a musician and as a, as a business leader as well, um, and you know, we have our academy this afternoon, there's a lot of musicians with us today. Um, what advice could you give to, and I ask this to a lot of people, what advice can you give to young musicians who are looking to, to succeed? What's the stuff that you can't, you can't Google? Well, you know, obviously, if you want to succeed as a musician, you've got to, you know, get a CD player and you need to be selling CDs. No, no, no. Um, the, the reality is that for, for musicians today, it's a very interesting world when you think about that next generation of musicians. And that's what we're very focused on at BandLab. You know, not just the rights holders and the owners and the people who see monetization in the traditional way that you and I remember, because, you know, we've paid for music in our lifetime. The entire generation of people below us and, and everyone in this room and likely everyone listening online, they've never paid for music in their lives. And therefore, the idea of earning from their music is also a foreign concept. That's not to say it's either or. Both can coexist very, very you know, comfortably, and we think that's actually going to be very exciting for the industry. But I would say that for a lot of that next generation of musicians, they've already moved past the idea that music is a product. The artist is the product, and the creator is the product. And I think nothing has really changed. I think it's more understanding. And for the biggest advice that I give to artists today is understanding what is the product. And a lot of them you know, sometimes are guided along the idea that their content is the product, really it's their creativity, it's them as artists. That's what fans and that's what users engage with. The consumer is always right and the consumer engages with you because of what you create for them. And I think you know, that if, if there's any advice I give, it's recognizing that you are the talent and, and making sure that you're in control of what you do or working with people who can support what you do, that's the most important thing. Whether that's a label and a major who can really support you in, in ways that you, know, you can't do independently or whether there are paths where you are able to do independently because of your direct connection with your audiences through social media, you are the talent, you've got to support yourselves and, and, and you know, companies collectively need to be creating the tools to support the creators in the modern creator economy. And, and, and on the flip side of that, when, you, when you're looking at artists or working with artists, are you seeing any, any common rookie errors? I like asking this question. I always ask that, you know, what, what advice you give to an artist, but also what are the rookie errors that you're seeing artists making and how can they rep repair them? I think, look, I think no error is irreparable. I think, you know, obviously if you, if you, uh, you know, sell something as an NFT, you know, there, there are some things you can't take back necessarily, although it depends how you structure the controls. But I would say a lot of the time it is also you know, artists looking and, and, and getting ahead of the actual situation for themselves. And I, I mean that more in, in, you know, worrying about things before they've built their engagement, you know, matrix and the way that they communicate with their fans and, the, and, and how they actually build that relationship with the people that consume and engage with their content. So I think, again, sometimes it's more about not them making mistakes as much as there is so much noise, there's so much information and so much guidance and advice from everywhere around the world, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's at amazing conferences that tend to give more helpful and constructive advice. But the reality is it's about not getting distracted and focusing on some of the things that really make you special and differentiate you. Again, the key word in our mind is that distribution isn't the problem, it's differentiation and focusing on what differentiates you versus everyone else is sometimes you know, the mistake that everybody, companies, Human beings, all of us, you know, make as well. You, 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 you mentioned those three letters, the, the NFTs. Are you guys getting involved in NFTs? I think, you know, when it comes to NFT, blockchain, you know, and, and, and certain things, I think ultimately you've got to get to the crux of, of what they're trying to solve. And I think ultimately when it comes to, you know, some of the solutions that are out there that blockchain can solve, there's a, there's a problem and there's a solution. And sometimes, again, 
you know, the way we look at it is looking at the problem and the solution, and there are many different technologies to be able to solve that. I mean, ledger systems can be solved and traceability can be solved with, for example, writing things on a piece of paper, but it's not the, as effective. It's not something that you keep the record on, you know, into perpetuity. And I would say that, again, you know, the way that we look at these technologies is really making sure that we don't let tech get ahead of the solution we're trying to solve for the users. Because if that's the case, you don't have a very good product, especially as a consumer-driven company in most of the areas of our business where we're directly sort of B to C. So, you know, we, we are exploring a lot of things. We've got some interesting projects in the works, but I would say that a lot of them are very much still focused on what's the problem that one's trying to solve. Is it about making sure that people get paid more fairly? If that's the case, then yes, certain aspects of rights management through blockchain are very, very effective, but what about for the people who don't care about getting paid, you know, because for them, music is something that supports their their TikTok, uh, you know, following, or their, their OnlyFans subscriptions, or their BAMLAB subscriptions, and the things that they get there, you know, those are different aspects that one has to consider when trying to look at a solution that solves it for everybody. And sometimes, you know, when we look at NFTs and things like that, there are some amazing things out there. I haven't bought any personally myself, I probably should. <laughs> I'll regret saying this in a couple of years, but, but there are some really interesting mechanics, I think, especially for different artists at different stages of the game. I think NFTs are a great way for, for certain artists to monetize their audiences, but it works for some, it definitely doesn't work for all. And I think, as we all know, every artist is different, and, and there's definitely not a cookie cutter solution to solving, you know, different challenges for artists today. Actually, the, the, next, the next person on stage, Ed Shapiro, uh, mentioned on, a, on what, an academy session recently, he said, don't make an NFT for the sake of an NFT. Um, and uh, so, so are there any questions for Meng before I ask him two or three final questions? We've waited eight years. There we go. We have a question <laughs> at the front here. Do we have a, a microphone, please? A clean microphone, I should say. Sanitized. They are sanitized. So the, the mic bearers always stand at the back and the questions always come from the front. It's, it's fate. If they stood at the front, the questions would come from the back. But we have, we have a question here. Who, who are you and uh, uh, what do you do? Hi. Uh, hi, hi um, uh, my name is Jamie McManus. I run my own uh, independent agency called Mischief Makers. Um, but thank you for asking. Um, nice clean mic. Uh, <coughs> at the opening, Jasper, you mentioned about diversity in the in industry as well, and a uh, question for Meng, if you don't mind, about how are you seeing the increase in accessibility from the new platforms uh, from a music producer's perspective? Uh, what's, what's some of the main barriers to entry uh, for uh, the less represented community, communities in, in the music production uh, space, and, and what advice would you give to music producers to sort of get on board and get into the journey? Yeah, there are massive barriers. I think, you know, our whole fundamental vision of, of BandLab as a world and where there are no barriers to making and sharing music. And I think, you know, some people think that means sort of aversion to rights holders and things like that. Not at all, right? As I said earlier, if you, if you want to be compensated fa for your, fairly for your music and you feel that as a priority or something you believe in, then getting, pay, you know, someone pirating your music or something like that is a barrier for you making and sharing your music, right? But when it comes to sort of the, the diversity and the accessibility, that's a huge thing that we care about at BandLab as well. You know, an interesting study was done by, you know, our friends at TuneCore and various sort of, you know, reports in the industry about the gender male to female split. A lot of production platforms, a lot of distribution platforms see 85, 15, 90, 10 splits, 95, five splits of male to female gender splits, especially as you get more, you know, more into music creation. You know, for us, we were very, very, you know, uh, amazed and pleased to see that on BandLab, you know, I, I won't take credit for something that we didn't sort of actively go out there and, and, and try to do from day one, but it's part of the ultimate vision of accessibility that we found that, you know, 65, 35 splits on BandLab of male to female was something we were very, very encouraged by. And I think a lot of that, when it goes back to the question of accessibility, was the fact that we've created, A, a free platform that is available universally, whether it's through the browser, you don't need gigabytes of, of software that you need training and years of going through tutorials to actually understand how to use. It's all on your mobile devices. Everybody has the mobile device in their hands. When you think about accessibility, you know, laptops and desktops are just starting to, laptops particularly, are just starting to get accepted as music making creation devices. But the reality is that when you look at, I think, 2019 data, two billion laptops and desktop devices versus, you know, six billion, seven billion smartphones, that's 2019. And in 2019, the data that, that, that was out there on, on Statista and some public sort of studies were that 80% of households in developed countries have access to a laptop, but in developing countries, that was more like 30%. So when you think about accessibility to music creation and, and production tools, before BandLab, 
Yes, Apple has a great, great product in GarageBand, and and you know has done a massive, massive things for independent artists and people who who needed something affordable to create their albums and and their music on. But yes, in the U.S., Apple may be the largest and biggest market share for smartphone devices, but 85% of the world uses Android. So if you don't have something that allows music production on Android like BandLab does, before BandLab there was really no other option. And again, when you talk about accessibility, it's not just about meeting people and, and, and learning how to use tools, that's hard enough in itself. But if you can only you know, afford affordable music production equipment and software you know, because you can afford an iPhone, that is you know, one of the massive barriers that people don't think about. And that goes way beyond you know, even just the music tech companies. A lot of the reasons why they can't do that is for developmental challenges. There are tech challenges in building for Android because of the myriad and the thousands and thousands of devices that are out there. But you know, to, to, to answer your question more succinctly, I think you know, everybody has the part to play, but a lot of that comes from also having, you know, we're very fortunate to have the freedom to, to be able to build a very aggressive model of supporting people with the tools in their hands that they already have and making sure that our platform works in all these, um, these devices and platforms around the world. Fantastic answer. Right, thank um, you. So, and, and thank you for the, for the question. Um, I guess the final, final question is, now you've already mentioned, well, you haven't mentioned that you're doing the enemy awards and that there's an Asian component <laughs> to it. Um, aside to that, what, what, what does the future hold for, for the group? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we've got, we, we've made a bunch of announcements in the last, uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, it seems like one's coming out every week right now, so you'll, you'll see the one today. Um, you know, the, we, we obviously announced the acquisition of, of Reverb Nation, which is, again, a phenomenal company that we've, we've known for, for many times, for, for, you know, more than five years now. I had a great relationship with the founders. It's, it's very, very difficult to build a, a company that's sustainable, profitable in artist services and something they've done despite being around since 2006. So to bring that in and extend the, the feature set of what we can do on BandLab, helping people make music, earn a living and grow their audience. These three aspects just really you know, supplant some of the things that we're doing there. You know, we just announced uh, uh, last week publicly that we formed Enemy Networks, which is where on our media side it's now being formed as its own entity, you know, supporting Enemy, Guitar.com, Music Tech, as well as Uncut Magazine, and the things that we can do there to, again to support the idea of music making. There's much more to come, you know, some of which, again, will come out today with, with what we're doing with the awards, but, but more on each side of the business. So um, you, you'll be one of the first to know, obviously, uh, <laughs> but I'm afraid I can't share that today. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you for not sharing what you didn't share earlier today, <laughs> and good luck with whatever it is that you didn't share earlier on. But, but um, I hope you can, I mean, it's brilliant chatting to you and, you, and hopefully everyone can understand why I've been trying to chase this guy down for about six years to speak at Music Matters. Um, brilliant story. Keep going. Um, I mean, just, just, some, just hearing you talking about, um, you know, how you're looking after artists and how you're working with artists and supporting artists around the world is fantastic. So, Meng, thank you so much for joining us at Music Appreciate Matters. that very much. Good luck. Good to see you.